Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, that was... <laughs> Wow, I have another raider. Or someone just played Screamo. Yeah, I think that's what happened. I think I have another raid though. Um, <laughs> Andy Attack 2018. Thank you for the raid and this and Slayer Music. Thanks for playing Screamo. Um. Hey, and welcome to the show today. Um, we're on uh, roadprogressive.org, and here's a uh, a article they put up. Uh, this is, I guess, this was, it was by uh, Stephanie Gelton and Randall Wright, uh, two prominent MMTers. Um, and the story goes, answers from the MMTers. Uh, this is posted uh, January 10th, uh, 2018, if, if you see. A uh, response are written by Stephanie Kelton and Randall Ray. A few, day, uh, a few days ago, Jared Bernstein posed uh, some questions for MMPers in order to gain a better understanding of our arguments. We appreciate his interest in our idea, ideas, and especially his direct appeal for clarification of our views. He raised four big questions, which our Australian counterpart, Bill Mitchell, has already answered in his own three-part series. What follows is a response from the two North American NMTers. Jared, overheating is possible, and taxing is a lousy me me mechanism for dealing with it. We agree that relying on Congress to raise or lower taxes to fine tune the, econ the economy will not succeed. We agree with Janet Yellen that stronger, stronger automatic stabilizers are needed to enhance cyclical stability, taking pressures or taking pressure off lawmakers and the Fed to be responsive to changing conditions in the economy. Having said that, we would note that our tax system is likely already to bias to pull in more revenue when the economy booms, as evidenced by the expansion of killing surplus during the Clinton years. We would add, as Jamie Galbraith rightly argues, that overheating, while possible, hasn't happened in at least two generations. As Jamie says, in quotes, as you can see, there haven't been inflation in the economy since the early 1980s. It collapsed with the end of the Soviet Union and with the rise of China as a supplier for consumer goods. So the Fed has all has been put, uh, patting itself on the back for decades uh, of holding back, uh, yeah, of decades of holding back a uh, phenomenon that doesn't exist. The Fed is like the little Dutch boy with the finger in the in the in the dike who never triggers her himself to look over the levee to see that the lake is dry. In other words, it's it's been a couple of generations since the U.S. economy experienced any uh, significant inflation. Since then, inflation has been a high a highly global phenomenon. We also note that neither mainstream academic, academic economists nor the Fed itself have a robust theory of inflation. By contrast, the academic economists who created MMT have a long history of studying inflation and formulating policy to fight it should overheating ever become a problem. See example of Pap Demetrius and Ray of 1992. Bill Mitchell and the new MMT textbook by Mitchell, Ray, and Watts, which I read and study and everything else between every day. 
uh, mostly anyway, uh, other than debating with people online. Anyway, uh, in any case, relying on the Fed is the worst possible way to try to fight overheating. As the Bank of England has explained, central banks do not control the money supply, nor do they have the tools to forcibly choke off an expansion of bank credit in order to fight inflation. The plain, uh, the plain fact is that the Fed cannot take money out of the economy, as Jerry presumes, like some kind of pickpocket rifling through our jeans in the dark of night. It relies on the overnight interbank lending rate, Fed fund rates, or Fed funds rate. As a policy instrument, it can take excess reserves out of banks or put them into banks. Uh, easy via quantitative easing, but this does not work like a brake a pedal or a gas pedal uh, on bank lending, which is how money gets into the economy. No central banker today believes that she can take uh, money out of the economy, as Jared puts it. While we will not go into it in detail here, we recommend a public option called the job guarantee in the job market at a base, uh, base wage to anchor the currency, helping to stabilize its domestic value against inflationary or deflationary pressure, as well as stabilizing its exchange value against other currencies. MMT has devoted the thousands of papers of research and over a quarter of a century to analyzing and reporting of the results. Indeed, we have completed a major study using conventional modeling techniques that shows that a universal job guarantee program would provide true full employment while actually moderating inflation. Finally, we remind Jer Jared that contra cont contractionary fiscal policy, tax hikes, or spending cuts is presented in standard macro textbooks of the Keynesian variety as the appropriate way to deal with an overheating economy. In other words, there is no daylight between functional finance and MMT, MMTers and conventional Keynesian theory when it comes to the idea of raising taxes to counter overheating. Nowhere in the mainstream discussion of the Keynesian approach is there hand-wringing uh, about the p politics involved in getting political body or parliament, Congress, etc., to carry out the fiscal tightening needs needed to curb inflationary pressure. Hence, Jared is not really raising the, a critique of MMT at, the, at all, but rather is critiquing long-standing advocacy of use of fiscal policy that has appeared to appeared in every Keynesian macro textbook published since World War II. Jared, what about the Fed? The central bank introduces another piece of MMT framework about which I'm confessed uh, which I'm confess, suppose uh, even if the economy is uh, below potential, the Fed decides it doesn't like all this money printing and deficit spending advocated by MMPers. See, first, let's be clear the Fed cannot just say no to Congress, as Bernanke said. We'll do whatever Congress tells us to do. And when it comes to de deficit spending, the Fed works hand in hand, hand in glove with Treasury coordinating operations to ensure uh, a payments always clear and b revoke it uh, revoke if congress decides to do so as it does as it did during world war ii or world wars uh let's see a link uh, see here for further elaboration neither the fed nor any other co country with control of its own central bank has ever balanced its own uh, treasury checks and none of them will ever do so just listen to this panel of financial market experts including glenn hayden former head of interest uh, interest rate 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 trading at morgan stanley and if you don't really uh, if you don't rather mmp has this right Oh, if you doubt whether MMT has his rights, excuse me.
Yes, the Fed could decide to hike rates to fight in, against expansionary fiscal policy, but it would not do so in the order to teach Congress a lesson. The Fed has a dual mandate and will not raise rates sharply in the ad, uh, absence of credible evidence that inflation is poised to accelerate. All the money finance deficit spending in the world won't provoke the world, uh, Fed if inflation is subdued. And the explicit goal of functional finance slash MMT is to allow the budget deficit to fluctuate as needed to maintain full employment price and price stability. Why would the Fed fight its own dual mandate? Far better to sit back and take credit. The bottom line is that the Fed does not uh, have veto, uh, veto rights over Congress. We, re uh, we rest assured by the twin facts that a, that a the Fed is a creature of Congress and can be brought to heel should that become necessary, and B, that the exist as exigencies okay, of uh, pro providing a smoothly functioning payments system and leave no room for the Fed to veto the congressionally approved budget under which the administration op uh, operates. Uh, let's see, Jared. Krugman's finance ability, uh, point, uh, point, point. Uh, Krug, uh, Krugman argues that self-finance is more inflationary that, uh, that bond insurance, but he's not making the above points about MMP's flawed IMO assumption that tax cuts could handily deal with accelerating prices. He's worried about currency debasing. We can address this very quickly. The improvement point uh, you raised was from 2011. Scott Fulweiler addressed it back then but it hardly seems relevant any longer given the improvement has since recognized that, that it makes no difference economically, whether deficits are bond financed or money financed. Uh, and if it makes a difference, then either both risk debasing or neither does. Wait a minute, let me see if I get that right. Uh, if it makes no difference, then either both risk debasement or neither does. Okay, so in other words, if it, it, it both risk or, or it doesn't either way. As Calton and Fulweiler, Explained in a Financial Times uh, Apple Appleville blog, the only possible difference is political, and on that front, money finance deficit spending wins out because budget deficit no longer adds to the national debt. With respect to financial, with respect to financeability, and the idea that investors could somehow prevent the government from accessing the bond market except at a punishing premium. We refer you back to the link below or above featuring Glenn had it and had it and uh Amar Raganti, former deputy director of the Office of Debt Management at Treasury, or to or by or to remarks by a former undersecretary of the Treasury uh Frank Newman is not enough to hand wave a conclusion that money financed um, deficits will lead to currency debasement or risk sharp rebuke from investors. You need to be able to demonstrate operationally why those might be legitimate risk. Uh, close study of the monetary uh, operations confirmed by experts in the field suggest MMTers had this right. Jared. Timing issues. Uh, re, uh, okay, so t timing timing issues. Review raising versus okay. So referencing uh, revenue raising versus printing money. A theme of more of my work to the to which MMTers often object. I think it, I think is that we need to raise more revenues to pay for the public goods. I recently wrote the example that given uh, that given our aging population, it would be it will take something like three percent more of GDP to meet our obligations to Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid by 2035. MMTers push back that as long as we're 
below potential, we can print the money to support government spending to stop getting uh, wound up about the pay, pay for us. Even, uh, even Alan Greenspan's testimony about the long-run implications of the aging population rightly rejected any possibility that government might run out of money. Government can and will make all payments as they come due. In truth, budget deficits are always expose the difference between spending the G and tax receipts T cannot be known until after the year's spending and taxing has, ta has taken place. There are three sectored, three sectoral, uh, sectoral uh, balances, a domestic private sector, wait and see, <laughs> a domestic private sector, a government sector, and a foreign sector. While any one of these can run a deficit or a surplus, the sum of the balance must uh, sum to zero. That is, the balance for every deficit, there is a surplus. In the U.S., the private sector almost always runs a surplus, saves. And the foreign sector always runs persistent surpluses at the other side of the coin to our current uh, account deficits since the days of Reagan. The, that means by simply or by simple identity that our government uh, sector runs deficits. Okay, so do that. okay. Uh, this actually has been the norm since the founding of the nation over 225 years ago. Government deficits will continue to occur so and so long as the sum of the private and foreign balances are positive. While almost universally uh, feared, government's deficits are actually the source of the positive net balance in our household and business sector. Uh, see, while almost universal, okay, saw that already. Uh, blah, blah, while our generation, generation today cannot dictate or even influence what the government's balance will all will look like 30 years down the road, we can safely predict that it will be a deficit or be in deficit. It, uh, if critics of MMT would study the work of when godly, they would understand this. Given aging, we need to shift 3% of the GDP to elderly over the coming decades. However, this will be done at the time we, will, we want to achieve the shift and it will be done through a combination of tax taxes on those uh, of working age and spending on those of retirement age. This has nothing to do with deficits in, the, in those years. It will need to occur whether uh, whether or not there, ha there are a budget deficit or surplus uh, surpluses then. And neither deficit nor surpluses today will either enable or constrain those deficits in the, uh, in the future. Should there should they occur? Only someone who confused about who is confused about simple aggregate accounting would think that there think that it is a proper uh, it is proper to tighten the fiscal stance today in order to keep the powder dry for you uh, for us later as the fuel to support deficits to deal with the problems of aging, the best way to prepare for an aging society is to start building the infrastructure, the care system, and the know-how we will need to, uh, and, yeah, and the know-how uh, we will need to take care of tomorrow's seniors. And as always, I'd like to share a few things here. Oops. Well, anyway. <laughs> Should I show you some else here? But uh, yeah, I highly recommend the, um, the Taming Inflation with Robert Hockett. Uh, Steve Grumbine of Obviously Real Progressives uh, on Macro and Cheese did an excellent interview with 
uh, Robert Hockett, uh, who is, you, I mean, you'd have to look him up a little more, but from what I gathered, um, he was a professor in economics uh, and stuff of that nature. Anyway, uh, but I would definitely look that up for you. Uh, play everything that is not real progressive. There's nothing but good stuff here. Um, anyway, so let's see where I was going for somewhere else. <laughs> Uh, that's not it. Let's see. Yeah, okay. Oh, yes. I'm going to do this one first. Now, I love to look at these things. Uh, this, if you don't know, is the daily treasury statement. And it tells you um, what the amount of U.S. treasury debt, they call, they call debt both good and bad. Uh, deposits are debts. Um, U.S. Treasuries are debts, even though those are literally just bank accounts that have a huge, uh, well, a better uh, yield or uh, yeah, uh, uh, yield than uh, a regular bank account or a regular uh, savings account. Now, this is it. Withdrawals. Uh, well, right now, see, uh, they've taken out nineteen billion four hundred and fifty six. I think is uh, is what as how I read that if that's correct. But this is the redemption portion. This is what I kind of want to show you guys. Redemption meaning to cash out, meaning to get to transfer into other types of uh, stocks, bonds, whatever, whatever have you. Uh, this is what they have. Uh, this is what they have rede uh, redeemed. People cashed out, uh, got cash for it. Uh, also, uh, as you can see, public debt, which, I mean, as I said, they, they, use, they use the term debt in, different, in two different ways, both as deposits uh, uh, into, uh, you know, uh, putting the money into uh, bills and e that's marketable uh, and marketable bill and cashing out the same marketable bills. Um, However, let's say we have government account series, which uh, which right now they have redeemed five hundred seventy three billion six hundred fifteen million. Uh, uh, fiscal year to date is seventy eight trillion six hundred fifty one billion seventy eight million. So that means that they they are cashing them out for cash to put into different agencies within the government. Uh, as far as foreign sector, Guy Ossini, uh state and local series, uh, was it like 1,821,000, some of that, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, the point being is total redemption uh, today or a couple of days ago now is 686,030,000. Uh, this month to date, or yeah, this month to date would be 10,955,955,000. Uh, after that, and then you also have again uh, year to date, uh, 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 fiscal year to date, eighty nine trillion two hundred sixteen billion four hundred thirty one. So it's not like we can't afford this. We can always afford anything. The only thing we have to have is those in office that are willing to authorize the treasury to cash out uh, the, those treasury bills for that for those amounts. That's all we have to do. Uh, we can we can get the Green New Deal. We can get uh, Social Security like up to snuff. You know, expanding that bitch, expanding Medicare, uh, having Medicare for all. We can have all these things. We have the money. We have the capacity. We have the resource capacity because that just means that they had to build more. Uh, stuff which requires materials, which which requires uh, work uh, workmen, but it seems like in order to be able to get the Green New Deal, it has to be under a jobs guarantee. Jobs guarantee, in my mind, is to be able to take in those people who have those kind of uh, skills that I uh, have may not have had a job in a little bit, get them up and running again as far as their skills, updating their skills if needed, and paying them above market value. Meaning if it say if is requiring to pay them say 40 bucks an hour, then they pay them 40 bucks an hour. And that 
brings in competitiveness within the labor market, forcing those same companies within, within those same related industries to have to up their wages and at the same time, allowing people to make an actual living wage, being able to afford uh, Medicare for All insurance, because Medicare for All uh, is deflationary, meaning it takes the it takes the over billing of services, goods, and not medication uh, out of the insurance companies and puts them directly within Medicare itself, that program would be, would take care, would take over that. And there's direct payment. There's no fighting, nothing of that nature. As far as negotiating prices, there is nothing. It's simply the hospital performs the service and turns into billing to Medicare. Medicare then pays it. That's it. <clears throat> uh, whatever premiums you would be paying for Medicare for All would be a lot, a lot, lot lower than your current uh, uh, your current medical insurance. Uh, yeah, so I don't see why it's so difficult to to get Medicare for all, I don't see how it, why it's so difficult to get uh, a, a Green New Deal through a jobs program. Maybe it's because those people who are in power have the outside influence keeping them from doing the right thing. Now, how does the right thing happen? In some cases, it's protesting, other cases, voting them out. But at the same time, how do you vote uh, those people out who have a community at home that works within that same organization or works within that same industry that they have investment in? Well, you have to otherwise convince them. You have to tell them the truth. You have to tell them that this is what happens if you don't. And this is what happens if you do. Which one would you rather take? Would you rather take the Green New Deal one? And that means that the temperature may go up a little bit, but it won't go past the, uh, the point of no return. That means that new jobs will be created. That means higher wages would be done. That means Medicare for all means that everybody who didn't, who didn't have insurance before or couldn't afford it wouldn't have to try to afford it. They'd have it. And that also means that those who may have died with pre-existing conditions in the last few years would have a better chance of getting the help that they need. Getting the procedures that they were forced to put off because the insurance wouldn't, wouldn't cover it. They would be able to get uh, possibly life-saving uh, life saving procedures done. But I don't know. It takes, it, it, it doesn't take a village. It takes a freaking state. It takes a freaking universe to get this done. So if you're out there and if you are watching this, listening to this, whatever have you, if you want, if you want your neighbors to be able to go and get whatever they need medically done, done to make sure we have Medicare for all. And don't uh, take the current crop of politicians we have running and already in office at their word. You can never take them at their word. This has to be a 24-7, 365 day a year, not holding their feet to the fire, putting their feet in the flame, making sure they get the point that without the votes, without the people to put them in office, they don't have an office to go to. 
Forget about the uh, the commercials you'll see. Forget about the commercials you'll hear. Forget about the the uh, niceties. You see them on the road, in the restaurant, whatever to have you. They're trying to placate to you, I mean, rightfully so, but they their attentions aren't uh, aren't pure. They're there to keep a job so they can keep making money until they decide to retire or until they are actually voted out. People like Bernie Sanders. He was, as far as I'm concerned, was on the right side of things. Then he decided to put a bullet through his campaign. And he listened to Barack Obama. He listened to everybody else. Now, in my, in my mind anyway, I don't know about yours. Your mind is your mind. You have to make it up yourself. But in my mind, he has lost total uh, street cred. If he chose to run again in 2024, I would have no problem not supporting him. Doesn't mean that other, obviously, I, I'm going to keep friendships with people who do support him, obviously, because their attentions are at least good. I can't say the same for Bernie Sanders anymore. Anyway, long tangent, but it's my tangent. <laughs> anyway, so as you can see, the U.S. Treasury is just mature, is a maturing saves account. The whole reason why I bring this up is because the Republicans, Paul Ryan, uh, and other people, have claimed that the public debt, the national debt, is all our fault. In reality, if you look it up, you look up corporate debt, corporate debt is the one thing that keeps climbing because they use the, the corporate bonds that they do have uh, and they get money through that way or they'll uh, sell their bonds to the Fed. The Fed would then give them money as a loan uh, and then they have to pay back the loan plus the interest. Um, anyways, the point being is the fact that the debt is not on us. Debt is on them. And it's time for them to pay up. It's time for them to pay with their jobs. It's time to get them out of office because while they've been in office, they have done nothing for us. Period. If you're listening to this, I implore you to whomever's running in your district, who's ever running in your state, doesn't matter which side. I don't like either side. Both sides suck. Both sides do whatever it takes for, them to, for themselves to either stay in power or make sure the other, uh, the other party stays in power. They don't want third parties. So we got to do what we got to do. Vote everybody out, even the good ones, because the good ones have, have uh, gone bad. Anyways, uh, let's see. There's something else I want to do here. Uh, damn, where is that? Uh, might be good, but no. Yeah, with that. <laughs> okay, so this is spot prices. Uh, spot prices, I believe. Uh, right to, right to, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, as you can see, things go up and shit. Uh, excuse my language. Uh, but let's see. This I think this this part will be very, even more interesting because as you can see on the right hand, uh, these are basically the the prices that are you know uh, changing, not changing. They keep going down as you can see. So let's see. Oh, actually, you know what? That's my bad. That's not what I'm. Jesus. Okay, that should be it right there. There we go. Okay. So let's see. 
Technically speaking, apparently gas should be in you know at you know certain places be down a dollar sixty one coming up. It looks like maybe I'm wrong about that, but uh, that's per barrel. So yeah, maybe down by say roughly ten cents or something to affect uh, Brentwood down. I mean it's all looking like it's down except for coal. Of course, coal's up. Um, steel, like everything that is required to build something or some to that effect is going down, which is good. That means that overall prices will go down as far as retail. Anyway, now that I wanted to show you, no big deal. Is there anything else I want to show you? Let's see. No, that's a, this is a video. I don't want to show that. Uh, anyway, that's what I got for the day. Uh, just remember, it takes you to do the job that needs to be done. Simple. Look more into Medicare for All. If there's a Medicare for All organization anywhere nearby you, or if you know someone who may be interested in doing that, go with a friend. Check them out. Uh, July 30th, uh, if you're in D.C., they're having a rally down there. I think it's March for Medicare. Um, check them out. Uh, live stream from there, whatever have you, as far as that part goes. But check them out. Look them up. Uh, there's a reason why I'm so into MMT is because it helps me look at the actual finances of these programs that I want for everybody to have because it will benefit your life. It will benefit your wallet. It will, be it will, be it will benefit everything that you need as a person. So MMT for me is the be end all, end all sort of thing. This is how you say it. I may be wrong about that, but anyway. And also, hashtag learn MMT. Peace out for now. I will probably do a uh, a article for my calvintaylor.substack.com uh, here momentarily. It's been a while since I've been on there. I've been concentrating on this and other things. So either way, check me out. Peace out for now.